Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be speaking with Winston Black about the Middle Ages. But first, a couple of administrative things. First, we want to say a great big thank you to our newest Patreon supporters, Gabby Sobral, Felipe Platek, Nash Mahoney, Sig TM, and Klaus Jensen. Thanks, all. If you'd like to join them in helping to support us, you can go to patreon.com slash endless knot or alliterative. I really have to figure <laughs> this out someday. <laughs> Anyway, just search for The Endless Knot, you'll find us. We really appreciate all of our supporters very, very much. Next, we have some exciting news about an event in October. The conference that we went to last year, the Sound Education Conference, is happening again. It's in Boston the week of, uh, just before Canadian Thanksgiving, in fact. Um, slightly inconveniently, but that's okay. <laughs> From October 9th through 12th, there are events happening. And once again, I'm organizing a linguistics panel uh, with a bunch of great people on it. Ray Belli of uh, Words for Granted, uh, who you mm -hmm. may well listen to already, but if you don't, you really should. And he was on He's, He was on our podcast, mm -hmm. so you may remember that episode. Also, the wonderful Helen Zaltzman of The Illusionist podcast. Another one you should be listening to. We have views about what you should listen to. You know that. <laughs> Carrie Gillen of the Vocal Fries. Another uh, podcast that we had on as a guest, yep. as guests here. And also Gretchen McCulloch of Lingthusiasm, mm -hmm. who also, you may already be aware, has a new book out uh, that we've talked about before, I believe. I can't remember now, but anyway, we <laughs> I've have... certainly been I've, I've certainly been uh, reading it and talking about it, reading it and talking about <laughs> in it real and, life, and posting about it on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the new book is because internet and it's all about the linguistics of uh, online language. Mm -hmm. uh, so what a great panel! Yeah, so that panel will be on the Friday. Mm -hmm. I'm also uh, convening a couple of panels. One I'll moderate when I'm not actually on. I just put it together. One is on using podcasts um, as assignments in the classroom, and the other is on. Uh, the intersection of audio, you know, recording or podcasts and academia, academic careers and how they help or potentially harm academic careers. <laughs> so those ones will be also on the Friday. And then there's going to be on the Saturday, um, a bunch of talks by podcasters. So that's if you're a podcast listener and would like to come and hear some of your favorite uh, podcasters, the Saturday event is probably the biggest draw. You can purchase tickets for individual days. You can also purchase tickets for individual sessions if you want, for just one session, if there's something you really want to go attend. Absolutely. So the website for that is soundeducation.fm. It has all the information there, the speakers, it, uh, a page for, for buying tickets, and the places and everything else. As I said, it's in Boston. Um, some stuff will be at Harvard, some at Boston University, and some at some other locations. Um, there's a couple of evening events going on before and after. Oh, one other person. So the keynote speakers are a number of them, but one of them is Helen Zaltzman, and the other is Mike Duncan from the History of Rome and Revolutions. Yes. So who we've also talked also to talked to on this about. podcast. So yes, it is very much hitting <laughs> our sweet spot in terms of <laughs> our interests, and we are going to, of course, both be there, mm -hmm. and we're very much looking forward to it. So. If you are going to be near Boston that week or weekend and want to drop by, we'd love to see you. Certainly, if you do attend, do let us know. Absolutely. All right. So turning now to our interview today, we spoke with our friend Winston Black. Mark, can you tell us a bit? Yes. Uh, Winston is a medieval historian and author of four books. Uh, he teaches courses in the history of medicine and is currently running a seminar on the Black Death, specifically. Uh, Winston has his PhD from the Center for Medieval Studies at the University of Toronto, as do I. Uh, today, we're speaking to him about his new book, The Middle Ages, Facts and Fictions. So without further ado, here is our conversation with Winston. So welcome, Winston. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. We're so pleased to be able to talk about this book. So uh, just to describe it uh, a little bit to the listeners, 
basically, this is a book that you know debunks a lot of popular persistent myths and misunderstandings about the Middle Ages. So our first question is, how did you come to write it? How, what's the sort of origin story? Uh, sure, for? yeah. Uh, it really came out of a series of fortunate coincidences and valuable connections. Mm -hmm. A number of years ago, I this was 2011, 2012, uh, I was invited to contribute to uh, a festrift, a volume in honor of a scholar of medieval medicine, John Riddle, uh, who's since mm. become a dear friend. And uh, he, uh, we didn't know each other before then, but our, our work overlapped. And uh, he really, really liked my contribution to that volume. And we got to know each other in person and by email. And a few years later, um, uh, he actually contacted me again uh, about co-writing a textbook with him. Uh, he had already done the first edition of a textbook just called uh, A History of the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And um, usually when you do these textbooks, uh, if you want to keep on doing them, they come out every six or so years. Depends on the press. And he's getting on in years. And he said he really needed some help uh, cleaning it up, getting the scholarship up to date, and anyway, he asked me to co-write the second edition with him. And that came out in uh, 2016, and that was very exciting. And that was really my first foray into, call it more popular history, uh, a history mm -hmm. made accessible for students and wider audience. And so a little bit after that, out of the blue, I got contacted by an editor at the press, ABC Clio. And uh, they said they'd actually seen the textbook, and they were wondering if I was interested in contributing to a new series they were thinking of on facts and fictions. Uh, they had a one volume lined up already just on Vikings. That's why there's no Vikings <laughs> in my book. I wanted to do Vikings, but there's an entire Vikings volume. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, I worked on that over the next uh, year and a half or so. And uh, it eventually, yeah, came out this, this last summer. Well, one of the questions we were going to ask you are, are you may still, but uh, is about unexpected connections and, and, felicitous coincidences and i guess there's there's one already <laughs> yeah, right? definitely yeah you gotta use who you know and so it was mm -hmm. great to have these connections here and it's great to be able to move from the scholarly to the sort of more more popular that's not always the easiest transition no no it's it's a very different kind of writing very different kind mm -hmm. of research and audience so i mean obviously this you know this opportunity came up kind of unexpectedly but why do you think this book and I guess this this whole series perhaps why now why is this particularly relevant at this at this moment and there's been myths about the middle ages for as long as we've called them the middle ages sure. why yeah. is it a particularly sort of <laughs> useful or necessary to debunk them now oh yeah absolutely it's 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 always been necessary I feel I mean I, I've been teaching medieval history since 2007 and it's always been at first, it's fun to see students coming in with misconceptions, and we, we fix them in class, and that's just part of teaching. But it really seems, I would say in the last 20 years, but even more so the last 10 years, the Middle Ages, especially a popular mythical version of the Middle Ages, uh, has become especially dangerous as it's become embraced by more radicalized groups uh, really around the world. I'm more concerned about North America, but it's certainly in Europe and in, in the Middle East. People want to embrace a vision of the medieval past that can support their view of the present or the present that they want. And mm. uh, this is especially problematic, of course, with the Crusades. Uh, I bring up in the introduction of my book, uh, and a lot of people will know about the listeners will know about this, but the infamous incident when right after the attacks on 9-11, President Bush called America's act of vengeance a crusade and uh, bringing up this medieval language of a righteous war. But of course, when we're in the context of a still a predominantly Christian nation fighting against a <laughs> explicitly Islamic group. Invoking the Crusades is, was a very bad optics. And of course, uh, not just medieval historians, but almost anybody informed about the past immediately called out Bush at, at that time. 
But that was just the first of numerous incidences that are becoming more and more common as alt-right groups, uh, neo-Nazi groups, and others are invoking a fictional, all-white, extremely violent past that they want to revive in some cases. Mm -hmm. And so uh, while I only brought it up really in the introduction of my book, I, I, that, that very serious uh, shadow is kind of looming over the whole work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they want something that they want to revive or they want to use the Middle Ages as a um, to validate or to mm -hmm. provide prestige for or in some way, yeah, give, give some legitimize, legitimize or, that was yeah. the word I was looking for, or make respectable any of those yeah. things, particular versions of, of the present, as you say, mm -hmm. it's we being wrong about the past might irritate us from a historian's point of view. But in a vacuum doesn't matter. It's what that effect has on the present is what you exactly. do with that information yeah. about the past. And it is striking that this, you know, co-opting of the medieval past comes at a time when, you know, medievalism, you know, in popular culture is also at the forefront. And there are so many, you know, like Game of Thrones or mm -hmm. so many popular conceptions of what a medieval world is like is, you know, uh, so current for a lot of people that and they get their their sense of you know if they're not experts they get their sense of what mm -hmm. the medieval world was like from these fictional accounts mm -hmm. and so they've got these two sources you know that are not very reliable they've got mm -hmm. the you know hollywood middle ages and they've got this online self-proclaimed historians yeah. Exactly, call it yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, which is not a, a dig at um, credentialism. It's a dig at education. Like what, hmm. what What are your, you don't need credentials, but you do need some kind of verification of the facts when you're mm -hmm. going to go around talking about the, the past. Yeah, and I mean, everyone knows that, as you say in your introduction, it's not that you're suggesting that people think Monty Python or Game of Thrones is correct. <laughs> of course, they all know their fictions, but nonetheless, the kind of general background or yeah. sort of understanding of um, the what the world was like is very heavily informed by that, mm -hmm. even if everyone knows that, of course, the facts are not correct. <laughs> I mean, that's a fun and, and constant problem on the lighter side of, of this, the other medievalism, uh, medieval fantasy in particular with the Tolkien and Game of Thrones and so on, or you say Monty Python, where, yeah, people watch it, they can say, oh, of course, there's no dragons. And of course, uh, uh, they didn't beat themselves on the head like that. But the rest of the background is correct, right? Mm -hmm. And and a lot of people do think uh, that, that that is somehow right. Like, I, I really uh, go after the TV shows that have the constantly filthy peasants mm -hmm. and, and people <laughs> or filthy everyone. And that's just what people expect uh, from a medieval-ish show. <laughs> People were dirty then, right? Mm -hmm. It lends authenticity. Yes, yes. It makes it seem like, because it has to be somehow different, uh, you know, that's part of constructing a fictional world is it has to look different from now. So if things are too much like now, then that means it must mm -hmm. be inauthentic. Yeah. And it's that idea of, you know, gritty realism, yes. like literally yeah. gritty. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's particularly true in this last, as I think you point that out in one of the chapters, yeah. on the one on peasants where, you know, the medieval world was filthy. You know, if you look back at Camelot or something like that from the mm -hmm. 50s, they don't have everybody dirty no. because their Middle Ages is a sort of high fantasy of nobility chivalry and chivalry. And, yeah. um, but it's part of the larger turn towards gritty realism in the last 15, 20 years. Yeah, I, th I really think it began in the 90s. And yeah, if I pull out uh, the Kevin Costner, Robin Hood is uh, yes, yes. starting to turn towards more dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and then the dirt's just become overwhelming now, where it's just everyone. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yes, okay, more dirt, sure. Like, yeah. you know, we have this in the ancient world, too. Uh, you know, the gleaming white marble of Rome in a 50s epic yeah. movie is, is certainly not true either. There's lots of that's not true either. So you have to flip the side and say, okay, so the more dirt there is in Rome, the more realistic. And, and to some degree, it's true, right? Yeah. You do need the world, like, streets of new york are filthy in their own way so you know it, you need some kind of real lived in realism sure. to it but but you can push it a little too far <laughs> yeah, yeah it's like the, the creators of hbo's rome where yeah the, the yeah. whole uh, great intro sequence is nothing but grit and graffiti and we know that was there mm -hmm. but was it really that dirty i, I don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> 
And so on that note, yeah. you've chosen, what is it, 10 or 11? I guess I got one big intro chapter and then 10 other myths, yeah. 10, 10 chapters. Yeah. So why those myths? You know, why you, you, you had to select, obviously, yeah. a particular number? What was the reasoning behind it? Oh, a lot of factors had to come into play. I wanted to, of course, use my own area of expertise, which really is medieval science and medicine. And so readers of the book will see that, yeah, it, uh, parts of it really lean heavily towards that. There's a chapter on the medieval church supposedly suppressing science, one whole chapter on medicine being nothing but superstition, one whole chapter on the Black Death. And I guess, actually, there's also the Flat Earth chapter that also has a lot of science. <laughs> so. There, I was really uh, playing to my strengths, but I also wanted to make sure there were some of the basic imagery myths, the sort of things we were talking about. When people think Middle Ages, they think, well, dirt. <laughs> they think Dark Ages, and that was the, the very first chapter. And then also a um, uh, chapter on peasants never bathing. So <laughs> um, trying to pull out the, some of the basic imagery of what people think of as stereotypical medieval. I wanted to have a few chapters on those. Oh, and I, yeah, I was also just looking at my chapter list here, uh, trying to remember. <laughs> Knights on horseback. Uh, a few chapters were difficult because the myths are things that do exist, but the myth is people mm -hmm. blow it massively out of proportion. Yes, people were probably dirty, right. but we overdo it. Yes, knights on horseback existed, but not nearly as much as movies want us to believe. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, just looking at my list here again. Oh, and of course, uh, there's a, a number of myths that belong to other eras, uh, especially witches. There's this uh, mm -hmm. overwhelming tendency to believe that, oh, Middle Ages, they believed in witchcraft and burned witches. Well, as you guys know, <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> that really is a post-medieval phenomenon. Yeah. And I uh, had to write a fine balance there. Really want my readers to understand, yes, this was a horrific and very real episode where several thousand people, mostly women, were unjustly killed for uh, these false accusations. But it ain't medieval. Mm -hmm. And so trying to find those threads throughout all the chapters of uh, reminding the readers some of these things are completely false. Others belong to another era. Others are myths of too much emphasis. It was, I, I, I know you, you asked me to think about also what uh, maybe didn't make it in. And I think mm -hmm. if <laughs> there's no reviews out of this uh, yet, uh, but I bet there will be criticism and there's bound to be criticism of what I didn't include. Hmm. Uh, right. So you could almost like write two books on this topic and 50, still not. They're called oh, history textbooks, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, in a sense, that's. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to be selective at some yeah. point, right? <laughs> and uh, an, uh, about a decade ago, a very similar book came out. Uh, it's called Misconceptions of the Middle Ages, I think is the title. Mm -hmm. And it's a great book, but that actually has over 30 chapters. Each one is only about four pages, and each one's written mm -hmm. by a different person. So mm. they could really hit everything under the sun. Um, <laughs> I really was given a limit of 10, 11 chapters, and they needed to be longer and have more material and a deeper exploration of how and why these myths came about. It really hurt. Uh, like I wanted a chapter about myths about women because there's so many preconceptions about, oh, women had no power in the Middle Ages. Women weren't allowed to leave the home. And, and more graphic ones uh, that you get, of course, from Game of Thrones, the idea of constant rape as being a normal part of medieval culture. I, this is a chapter I really wanted to include, but a goal I had for each chapter was I needed to balance out the primary sources. And that's one of the things that makes mm -hmm. this book different from any other book on, on historical myths. And that's how ABC Cleo is pitching this series. Each chapter is going to have and has uh, sources that represent how the myth came about, but also sources that show how the myth, the, fec the fiction is wrong. And mm -hmm. it was really hard to find a written source in particular that projected that myth that I think is so common about a series of myths that's common about women in the Middle Ages. What I really needed was a bunch of film clips, <laughs> and right, I, I couldn't right. do that uh, with this. 
And so, yeah, uh, that was that was a chapter I wanted to include. Likewise, um, a chapter on race and diversity in mm -hmm. medieval culture. And again, that taps into these uh, really dangerous myths that are um, being perpetuated more and more now about this myth of a, a lily white, purely northern Christian uh, Europe that didn't exist, mm -hmm. but that certain people want to see uh, in the past. And again, the, the sources of the myth tend to be movies, which yeah. mm -hmm. show this purely white, purely Christian, frankly, it looks like a Protestant Christian rather than a Catholic Christian. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're 20th, <laughs> mid 20th century, later 20th century movies that really don't understand and don't want to understand how complicated and different the Middle Ages were from modern America and Canada and Western Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And yeah, I mean, that's something that is not going to be explicitly discussed, but it will just be shown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? And so how do you how do you find a source yeah, for and that? Cherry, and cherry pick. Well, yeah. I mean, there probably are sources, but I can very much imagine you wouldn't want to include them because the sources you'll find, mm. the written sources there are in the world right now, but you know, they're straight on hate speech. Oh, yeah. They're straight yeah. on like, like you could go on to the internet and you could find <laughs> people giving their explicit, yeah. but they, you know, they're not in any way scholarly. They're not even widespread in the mi mainstream. You know, you'd mm -hmm. have to go and find places that we all hope most people aren't looking yeah. And they would be upsetting enough, I think, that you probably wouldn't want to include them. They would have to, for, for something that was popular and mm -hmm. kind of yeah. readable. And that, that was a conscious choice I had to make after a bit of uh, going down that very dark rabbit hole, mm -hmm. uh, spending some time on 4chan, 8chan, mm -hmm. looking briefly at uh, Anders Breivik's hate treatise, treatises, yes, uh, which invokes the Templars. Right. And that was it. Yeah, I, I didn't even want to touch myths about Templars mm -hmm. in this, in, in part because there's a quite good uh, recent book specifically about crusade myths. Mm -hmm. And so while these books can and should overlap a little, <laughs> this this book about crusade myths just came out about two years ago. So, yeah, I ended up with one chapter uh, about crusades, specifically just about the children's crusade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to find this one crusading myth that was something that really didn't exist at all. <laughs> Whereas, of course, yeah. the Templars did exist, but people have built an entire world of myths about what they wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of balancing acts in the book. What do I include? What do I not include? What do I want to read? And I frankly got mm -hmm. just physically and emotionally sick going into some of the very dark places of medieval myths. Mm -hmm. uh, I want this to be a serious book, but also <laughs> not one about that part of medievalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to the point of the of the audience and sort of goals. Mm -hmm. You know, who who is envisioned as the audience for this? What is the goal of the book in a larger sense? Like, how does it fit into the landscape of who's going to read it, and how it how do you imagine it being used, mm -hmm. or how would you like to see it used? Yeah, that was yeah uh, another balancing act between what I wanted and, of course, what the 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 press wanted. Uh, ABC Clio is very clear about this is a book for sitting on a uh, high school or college library shelf, mm -hmm. and especially a book that a student can, uh, on their own or be assigned by a teacher, one chapter. Uh, they could do a little project on it. They could dive deeper into it. And, and ABC Clio is uh, really famous for that. For over 60 years, they've been making mostly history books, as their name suggests, for high school and college level classes. Uh, so it's not meant to be a book that you're going to find at Barnes & Noble or Chapters. But it's a book for, yeah, that, that I, I want, of course, uh, for my own vanity and uh, pocketbook uh, right. that does uh, <laughs> find appeal for a wider audience, just for mm -hmm. pop readers, but also maybe even for uh, professors and scholars or non-medievalist uh, professors of history to dip into uh, from time to time. It was really gratifying to find out I was talking to a senior medievalist who was looking through the book and they knew most of it, but they had never even heard of the myth of Pope Joan, which I thought, <laughs> at least among medievalists, wow. was uh, normal. Yeah, and, yeah. So they, they suddenly realized, here's something new for me. Or um, mm -hmm. they, of course, knew that medieval people didn't believe the earth was flat, but they didn't know about the background of Washington Irving. Uh, being yeah. the main perpetuator mm -hmm. of that myth. So 
Um, I, I, I hope uh, it can reach both audiences, uh, primarily mm-hmm. for, for uh, students and teachers to use in the classroom. Uh, yeah. But also, I sure hope it comes out in paperback. It's only in hardcover right now. <laughs> but uh, reach that wider audience uh, because I really wanted to make it accessible and readable uh, quickly, a chapter at a time. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, you know, even for professors who may or are aware of these myths already, it provides. And I think this is one of the the really exciting things about this book is it provides those primary sources. So they may not, you know, they may be vaguely aware, yeah, this is a myth, uh, but exactly, you know, what the paper trail is there, you know, how did this happen? They may not know those details. And so it can be useful to that audience for that reason. Yeah, that they can uh, dip right into it without having to do some of that uh, pedagogical legwork. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Thinking of the very first chapter on the Dark Ages, this, of course, is uh, terminology that goes back centuries, not a modern mm-hmm. myth. And being able to yeah, show to you just any reader, but also to a teacher who might not know where, where this language comes from, um, mm-hmm. what they can show to students about the sources of these myths. Because I really do find that a really interesting part of it. And I really like the primary sources. Mm-hmm. Um, in particular, the primary sources about how the myths developed. Yeah. yeah. That seems to me the most un- like surprising or unusual part of it. The, the primary sources debunking it are really good, but it's the primary sources about how the myth gets created and transmitted that I find very interesting. I mean, yeah, I- a lot of that stuff I didn't particularly know, you know, especially no. all these later writers who were yeah, all the 18th, 19th this, century yeah, writers. This, this, you know, imaginary idea of the Middle Ages. Yeah. That was really cool to read. I mean, yeah, I mean, some of this stuff coming to the book, I had known already, obviously, but I did a lot of research. And really, uh, if you read through the whole book, you realize, uh, I really have a bone to pick with Jules Michelet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like realizing just how much damage <laughs> this yeah. mid-19th century French superhero of historiography. I mean, one of the founders of history as we know it. So, yeah, just mm-hmm. how much uh, damage he did and just myths he created left and right. But yeah, there are more, much more recent people that I go after uh, as well. Mm-hmm. But I, I, of course, uh, found, found that myth hunting to be the the most interesting part in some ways, and it's I think it's turning into another career for me. Uh, I've got uh, <laughs> several more projects planned, which follow along these lines of I never thought I'd be doing it, but of medievalism, uh, the, mm-hmm. the the shaping of the semi mythical Middle Ages, especially in the last two hundred years. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. That's, that's mm-hmm. what's uh, re- really interesting me, and um, it's turning into several other projects. That's interesting. You know, when you think about when I when we were talking about the what you chose to leave in and what leave out or not put in, mm-hmm. um, and you know the reasoning behind not putting in one about myth and um, about the myths about a white Middle Ages because of how dark it is, mm-hmm. and I think that makes perfect sense for as you know having it as a teachable thing in high school. Like what what can you put in that's going to be palatable to everybody mm-hmm. that's going to be useful, and I think also I mean who knows if it will actually if, if this who knows how any of this works and how debunking myths actually functions. There's this whole psychology behind it that's very complicated. But by not specifically addressing those sort of core centers of some people's beliefs, I think you may be actually be, may be able to kind of be more useful in some ways. Because what I find really interesting about each of your chapters is how good a job they do at explaining why myths are created. And why they're created the way they are and how they're useful to the, how particular interpretations of the past are useful to the people who interpret the past that way. How they're shaped unconsciously by certain kinds of, you know, contemporary political or religious or whatever situations. And then how they're consciously exploited Mm -hmm. or used as polemical devices or whatever, you know, whether it be religious, whether it be about a narrative of progress, whether it be in the services of nationalism, you know, whether it be all of these different ideas by showing that process as you do with the primary sources and with your discussion in a, I mean, you you have a polemical position, but it's not because the discussions you're ma- you're having are not these really, really scary stuff. 
you were able to sort of do it from a reasonably dispassionate position, I think. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you know, you, you sort of, as it were, show your hand in the introduction, yes. but and, and I, I think that's good and, and right. But, but, you know, you aren't addressing the like absolutely most toxic stuff in the chapters, especially in many of the chapters, it's, you know, reasonably light as it were, yeah. like the, the dirty, the bathing one or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you're still, what you're modeling is that kind of critical history and thinking about why would somebody have come up with this mm -hmm. story in the first place? And ideally, I mean, this is the idealism yeah. of the teacher speaking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These things we always hope we're doing. Ideally, that leads people to think about, well, why are other stories out there mm -hmm. the way they are? What are the processes that shape the way I think I know about the past? And is it worth me looking into it? Yeah. If a story fits my own narrative too well, is that maybe in itself a sign that I should look more carefully at it because it fits the narrative of the person using it? Mm -hmm. At least I hope. I mean, yeah. it seems to me, I really want this series to do something about the ancient world in the same way. Because I am very close to assigning one of your chapters to my students just as a model of yeah. the method. Oh, wow. yeah. Like I would love to, but I'm, I'm, I'm teetering on the, you know, you always have to make decisions about <laughs> sure, what you can yeah. include, right? You know, because none of what you're doing, you know, it's all very much in the Middle Ages as it ought to be. Uh -huh. Though I'm just trying to sort of think, is there one of these chapters where it overlaps enough with something that the ages own? There might be. Um, well, I suppose the first chapter. The first, is, yeah. Yeah it, yeah. it it puts the Middle Ages beside the ancient yeah. world. No, exactly. So, so that one might be, mm -hmm. but like some of the other ones are that the, the pointed debunking of one story is a mm -hmm. nice mm -hmm. yeah. um, hook for it. But so anyway, but I really, cause I really do think as a, as a, an exercise in historiography, mm -hmm. but not labeled that because that makes it sound really boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no. Myth, myth busting, call it myth busting. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, I think there are volumes, I don't know if they're out yet, on Rome and Egypt. Um, well, I will I, I definitely have to look for that. Can't speak yes. to their contents or quality, but yeah, they, they certainly would do a similar thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, you, you found me out, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, first, though, thank you for that, 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 that praise of the, the chapters. That means a lot. But yeah, obviously, I didn't want to be too modern and polemical, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, except in the intro, as you saw. And and I think most of these chapters, no one will be offended, uh, yeah. I, but they'll start thinking more deeply uh, where I don't there, there, of course, there are people very deeply invested, unfortunately, in crusade history and continuing mm -hmm. that. But I, I really can't imagine many people being bothered to find out that the children's crusade is mostly a myth. Mm -hmm. And or, or likewise with uh, the very final one, Ring Around the Rosy. Almost everybody, it seems, grows up with the rhyme and grows mm -hmm. up, quote, knowing that it's actually about the Black Death. And yeah, it's just a product of later 20th century conspiracy hunting. We love that stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we want to find it in the past. And so I think you're absolutely right that if we can just take all of these less... <laughs> Less, less emotive, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, less immediately politicized uh, aspects of the past. It starts building up a, a new picture of the Middle Ages. Oh, wait, <laughs> maybe I have to question my preconceptions about women in the past, about race in the past, about increased diversity and greater tolerance in the past than I thought actually existed. Mm -hmm. So there's a hope. Yeah. And I mean, that's obviously a place for the more directly confronting scholarship and also popular, like, I, I think these are all important and useful. You know, if somebody were to come out of this thinking, I really need to know more about other stuff about the Middle Ages, one wants there to be works on those more difficult and emotional topics too. Yeah. But I think there's a place for a sort of entry level thinking about the past mm -hmm. and the histories and myths of the past that, that somebody might be willing to read. Yeah. 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 You know, there's just that, like, pragmatically, it, you need them to open the book before mm -hmm. anything inside it can help. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you're right. This is a really great example of the, you know, the methodology of mm -hmm. how to think critically. Mm -hmm. And and since it has, you know, the sources there as well, you yeah. know, how to read critically mm -hmm. and see, you know, by example, how things went wrong. You know, mm -hmm. by people miss, uh, you know, getting the wrong end of the stick from some little comment that was made at one point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the and the fact that you've got, a, I don't know if this was part of your balancing act and choosing topics, but you've got 
myths that come about in a bunch of different ways. As mm -hmm. you say, like mm -hmm. some of them, like the Children's Crusade just essentially never happened. Pope Joan didn't exist, but Pope Joan was written about in the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. whereas the Children's Crusade wasn't really written about as a Children's Crusade until after the Middle Ages. Those are two different ways the myth develops yeah. versus the, you know, ones, so things that where the, where there was, where misreading of the sources is the, is the reason is you know one reason or others where the sources exist and they say things but they're lying mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. how do we know how do yeah. we figure out that they're lying mm -hmm. what gives us that evidence um you know like having a bunch of different mechanisms as it were for these myth creation and, and with, levels with, of incorrectness some of them yeah. are like the knights on horseback yeah. you know as you say that's it's not untrue it's, there were knights on horseback they were valuable and important and people cared about them so it's that that one's a matter of scale, like having those different levels, I think mm -hmm. really helps illustrate it too. And with the flat earth chapter, how the sort of mythologizing around Columbus mm -hmm. as a national role model or whatever, mm -hmm. in know, nation building, nation yeah. building yeah. and how that, you know, implies this untruth about the middle ages mm -hmm. that, you know, so there's this very political uh, agenda that produced the myth. Mm hmm. In other words, what we're telling you, listeners, is read this book. It's <laughs> yes, really good. And assign it to students. Because I really, <laughs> I, I, that idea of um, being able to just like assign a chapter yeah. or in, yeah. you know, in a class being able to say, okay, everybody pair up. You're going to take a chapter each and you have to find one, you know, in, contextualize one of these sources a little bit more or do a presentation on it to the rest of the class just basically based on this or, mm -hmm. you know find uh, four pieces of evidence in contemporary pop culture of this myth being used would right. be like an easy one, right? Mm -hmm. Like you say, yeah. you don't have the, you don't have, you talk about the movies, but you don't have the movies. Well, that would be an easy thing to do to assign sure. this and say, okay, find two movies in a TV show mm -hmm. or like find something in contemporary pop culture that displays this myth and then mm -hmm. explain why they used it in that movie. How did it advance the purposes of the goals of that movie? Like, mm. Why did they choose this myth? What? How was it useful to them? Yeah, that would be a great exercise. It makes me wish I had at least just one one page in the book, uh, <laughs> off, offering yeah a few study questions yeah. uh, or uh, proposals for yeah how to take this further. But yeah, movies are of course uh, what can't be in this book. I mean, they're mentioned by name, but uh, it's so valuable to even watch five ten minutes of thousands of <laughs> problematic yeah. medieval movies. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a great success last year uh, teaching Crusades uh, seminar, and we watched uh, pretty significant sections of Kingdom of Heaven. Ah, yeah. Right. And, yes. <laughs> and there's some of it that I, I really appreciate, but some of it is incredibly problematic. <laughs> and <laughs> it, was, it was one of the things, I was writing this book at that time, and it was one of the things that really taught me uh, about the importance. Don't just tell students and readers you're wrong if you believe this. It's so mm -hmm. so essential in, in you to have, have, have grasped this. Why the myth came about? What does it mean to us or to people in the later 19th century or whenever? That, that, that's part of history, too, and something mm -hmm. yeah. uh, really important to know uh, about these myths. Yeah, it's not just a question of, you know, nitpicking and saying, oh, well, this is wrong or whatever, but it's it's actually engaging with well, why. Why is mm -hmm. why does that myth exist that I think is... And does it matter if it's wrong or not? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, pieces of chronology, like in um, Rome, the series, for instance, you know, they mess, they, they mess with the chronology quite a bit to shorten up the timeline of uh, the early of the end of the republic and the events that lead to the civil war you know for obvious narrative reasons for obvious sort of pacing reasons do i care about that no like i don't think it matters it's interesting of course if you want to study it <laughs> but you know it doesn't it doesn't make any difference to what that story means mm -hmm. in any big way now do they drop all of antony's wives yes they drop all of antony's uh -huh. wives and they create this, you know, the mother of Octavian into this totally other character. Is that good from a narrative point of view? Yeah, it does great things for the characters in the narrative. Is it a point that I do want to talk about with students and say, Absolutely. well, now why would he drop Fulvia and but characterize Atia like Fulvia? Like what, why have they dropped it? What, what do they gain by making Antony not married? And how incorrect would it be for any major, like the, the idea that any politician at the time would be unmarried for any length of time is just ludicrous. It doesn't make any sense at all. That, that's how you made political matches. Of course, you're married all the time. 
you know, like, so in that worth talking about, it doesn't mean I hate the show, but it means it's something it's worth bringing up because it tells us a lot about like, what is, what was, we get to then talk about, well, what were marriages like in the ancient world and why did they exist? And how is that different than we we think of as marriages now? And, you know, what was the role of women and why are they presenting this woman in this way? So that's a myth that's, or, you know, that's a, a historical change. It's in the myth in this case, but a historical change that's worth discussing. Mm -hmm. Whereas why they moved Julia's death to, you know, just the year before the civil war or sure. whatever, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel the same way about costumes and weapons in medieval mm -hmm. shows and movies. There of course are corners of the internet uh, where people will get very worked up about this mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, dismiss a show because uh, someone's wearing a back scabbard and the wrong kind of leather armor, or they didn't have that dye. <laughs> Like I don't care. <laughs> it's like it, it, that, that, that back scabbard looks freaking cool. I I, I don't care. <laughs> it's just it's not part of my agenda. But mm -hmm. yeah, there's different levels of myths and what what you want to ex expect from. I mean, here we're mostly just talking about fictional representations. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess my main concern is how do they shape then also our knowledge of the actual past? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it deeply. It really deepens and com complexifies is not a word, but let's pretend it is. Um, <laughs> complexifies. Complicates. Com oh, yes, right. Oh, how can I be a, an academic and forget the word com to complicate as a verb? Goodness me. It complicates and problematizes. Um, <laughs> the, uh, no, the, um, the Middle Ages as a period, which of course you start off by just explaining how ridiculous it is to be, to paint it the Middle Ages with one brush, period. But also the idea that there are narratives within that period itself of people already mythologizing their own past, right? Like giving us that layer of saying, it's not just that now we're getting it all wrong, because I think that's part of it too. It's not just that now in the 20th mm -hmm. century, suddenly we're making things up or getting it wrong or politicizing the past or something, that that has been happening since people have been writing histories. Um, I think that helps to make the medieval world a little clearer. Well, of course, you know, a lot of the the myths about the Middle Ages are, you know, commonly circulated in the sort of popular world of medievalism, including, you know, fantasy novels and movies and so forth. And gaming uh, is another place, you know, in, in both in the, the world of video games and, and the world of tabletop gaming, like Dungeons and Dragons is the really famous example of that. Mm hmm. Yeah, that was another sort of a glaring absence if people are looking for it in the book. I mentioned D&D, &D, Dungeons & Dragons, uh, in the introduction, but I had to make a tough personal choice not to include much of it in the book because it's too close to home. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I told you guys this uh, years ago, but my, my mother worked at Dungeons & Dragons at TSR oh. for many years. Uh, she wrote fantasy novels. And uh, I grew up uh, at the feet of the creators right. of uh, d and uh, I knew Gary Gygax. Wow. Oh, cool. And it, it's something I uh, had to grapple with just in my own identity as a medieval historian. How much has d and and other uh, fantasy, Tolkien and so on, shaped my view and my goals and my interests uh, in medieval history. And for a lo longest time, I would say it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> I am a serious <laughs> scholar. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I have left that foolishness behind. And of course, in, in, in grad school and in, in college, I played, I continued to play tabletop gaming, but tried to keep it as separate as possible. But in writing this book, I wanted to grapple personally more with what does Dungeons and Dragons and similar gaming systems mean for me as a medieval historian, how might it have shaped some of my interests? And years ago, when I started working on my doctoral thesis, very boring work on uh, medieval church law and church administration. Uh, Not, my how could you call that boring? <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a few, few nice people in Germany who are interested in it, but <laughs> there's a reason why I've switched to medieval medicine. But uh, mm -hmm. my, my mother actually asked me, why are you working on this? What's the appeal? And I, I took a few days to answer it and said, it's like D&D &D stats. 
It's <laughs> it, it really is like a dungeon master's rule book, uh, right. where just the rule upon rule upon rule uh, with levels and going up the ranking of the church and you gain greater powers. It, <laughs> it is what I thought about is astonishingly similar. And I guess uh, I mean, that was the, the, the personal connection there. But it, when it comes to the book and thinking more generally about myths, yeah, I've, I, I didn't put it too much in the book, but thought about what does it mean to pop viewers, uh, amateur historians and so on, uh, who might unconsciously think, uh, if they're familiar with D&D or similar gaming systems, what does it mean where you have a world with clearly delineated races, each with mm. strengths and weaknesses? What does it mean to have a world where, which is dominated almost entirely by men? <laughs> men playing mm -hmm. it, boys playing it, uh, and playing almost entirely male characters. I know that's changed, thankfully, in the last dozen or so years. But growing up in the 80s, <laughs> it, it, it was a boys' world. Mm -hmm. And there's been some serious work done more recently on it, on the difficulties, the legacy of gaming, and especially of Dungeons mm -hmm. & Dragons, how it is as you said, complicated and problematized our view of the medieval past. Mm -hmm. and, or uh, oversimplified it. Oversimplified it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And again, again on a, a really personal note, uh, my, my older of two sons is nine, and mm -hmm. um, he's certainly got an inter interested in fantasy and gaming. And just a few days ago, I rolled up my first, uh, first character with him mm -hmm. using the Pathfinder system and not D&D, &D, which... Uh, kind of hurts me on a personal level, but <laughs> it, it, it's what folks play around here where I'm living now. So, right. But uh, I was thinking if I could do this book over again, I think it would go back and maybe include more tabletop gaming. Mm -hmm. But as we were talking about earlier, I think the problems and the interests there especially have to do with gender and race, right. portrayals of women and this uh, fictional no notion of races. I'm an mm -hmm. orc, I'm an elf, I'm a dwarf, and this is what makes me. There's a dangerous mm -hmm. essentialism of races. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that can unfortunately be ported to the real world and help support uh, essentialist ideas about what makes this idea that races are real, <laughs> that they are mm -hmm. defined by this or that attribute mm -hmm. and stat. And that's very that's dangerous. Right. And that's, I think, oh. uh, give a plug here for the Pathfinder system. I think D&D &D more recently has overcome it. But in their publications, they're very careful now to show women not just in ripped bodices, <laughs> not just yeah. as objects to be conquered or saved, and likewise um, show people humans of all colors and classes and backgrounds. I think they're, they're, they're aware of some of their difficult legacy. Mm -hmm. I almost wish when I'm when sees wise I did, and I don't know that this would solve all the problems. It probably wouldn't. Yeah. But if originally D and D had had separate species, not races, yeah, right. it wouldn't have hurt. Let's just put it that way. I'm, well, I'm not uh, saying that I'm not saying that would have <laughs> solved it all. Like different humanoid species, being it would still be essentialist. But like I think we all have pretty much accepted that humans are essentially different than cats, yeah. and I don't think that's problematic. So you yeah. Know, but just by terming it races, mm -hmm. it, it did the, yeah, there's a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot yeah. going on there. Pathfinder tries to get around that, uh, calling it ancestry rather than race. Mm -hmm. so, but yeah. still, yeah. it's still the same Sorry. thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you do, I mean, you do talk in the book a little bit about video games. Yes. And of yeah. course, there is that, I mean, I'll, obviously, first of all, this general mishmash of myths and, and building all these myths together. And that certainly is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. But also when you're talking about essentialism, you know, there's nothing like we're playing Age of Empires with the kids right now. Yeah. And like, well, if you're an, a Byzantine, here's what you are able to do. And if yes. you're, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you can, if, if you're Teuton, you can do this, and this is what you're best suited mm -hmm. to. And and that's not even, I mean, that is races in our sense of the word, really, exactly. or nationality. Yeah. So it becomes, it's, it's essentially ethno-nationalism, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, you know, done in order to, I don't think done with in malicious intent in any no. way, <laughs> but, you know, it's for the convenience of and, and ports vaguely towards actual cultural mm -hmm. truths about them. But, like, cultural truths about what armament they had at any period or something but mm -hmm. yeah it you know there's an underlying view of the world there that is very troubling and it's it's hard to 
we're playing with our kids and they're 12 and eight right and mm -hmm. At what point in the fun video gaming night do you stop and say, well, okay, now listen, kids, but I want you to understand here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like I, I bring up civilization games uh, mm -hmm. in the Knights chapter and just the centrality yeah. of the knight for defining the, quote, medieval level of the civilization. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to make our world a bad place. Right. <laughs> but, it's not yeah. ruining the world, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, more seriously, this very problematic, yeah, I, I still play all the time, uh, what am I playing, Civ Five. Uh, I haven't mm -hmm. bought Civ Six yet. Don't. Uh, I don't, don't have much. Yeah, I've heard that it's... Don't. A mess. We yeah. did, and <laughs> but we, pretty unplayable. We, 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 we tried it once. We can't, yeah, I can't play it. <laughs> yeah. but I, I loved uh, Civ 3 and Civ 5. Yeah. But yeah, when you suddenly run into the Zulu, and here mm. is as problematic an image. And yeah, it's a strong ethno-national state, but they have this very problematic image, of course, of the Zulu warrior. Um, mm -hmm. Or of a say less dangerous but you've got the viking and at least he doesn't have a horned helmet but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's well and, it, and you contrast that with abraham lincoln is your oh, american right yeah. and so it's sort of like <laughs> is this how, america yeah. how are our myths yeah, yeah obviously america is a yeah. man in a suit who's freed the slaves yeah. right like yeah. well that's america whereas yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then yeah, you've got so, Gandhi nuking people. It's all very complicated. That, that's always fun. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a, another choice. I mean, there's things that came out of my personal life where what gaming I do is mostly slow turn-based games rather than mm -hmm. first-person shooters because those scare the heck out of me. Oh, no, so <laughs> I've, nev I've never, I mean, I... Yeah, uh, uh, Wolfenstein came out when I was already a teenager, and I just wasn't ready for that, <laughs> having, having grown up just with Mario and the, the yeah. first Nintendo. <laughs> but I, I am, here's where I'll, I'll point where I'll plug my next book. ABC Cleo's already asked me to write a sequel to this just Ooh. on the Black Death. Oh, very cool. Because they loved my Black Death chapter, the very last one. Mm -hmm. And I already included two myths in that chapter. And mm -hmm. while I'm not, I won't call myself an expert in the Black Death because I haven't done original research on the topic, I have taught the course, uh, courses on the Black Death for many years now. Mm -hmm. And I'm directly engaged with really the top Black Death scholars in the field and want to be at the cutting edge of teaching the truth about the Black Death. And right. I just bring that up because um, I need to find some time to uh, watch somebody uh, you guys might be familiar with it. There's a brand new PlayStation game called Plague an Innocence Tale. I think I want to oh, call okay. it. That. We don't have PlayStation. Yeah. That's the yet, yeah. so well. Yes, uh, but yet. I think it's also on <laughs> it's also pushing on it, but yeah. I think it's also on PC and probably will come out for right. iOS. So you need to get somebody uh, to play it for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I've certainly watched several trailers and YouTube videos of this. And here I think this game, it looks pretty interesting. But it's going to shape, very much shape, mm -hmm. uh, for the next five years, the pop right. understanding of plague. And mm -hmm. in this game, the main thing one of the characters has to do is not be caught in the dark. Because you will be overwhelmed by thousands of plague rats. <laughs> <laughs> and they will kill you and kill your little brother. And uh, wow. um, I like the idea that you're in the game you're playing a first person, a teenage girl who is mostly defenseless. And so hmm. you have to survive on your wits. So I like that. That's another issue mm -hmm. entirely. But this, of course, is, as I said, going to shape uh, images of plague. And then, oh, this just is driving me crazy. The girl is being hunted down by a malevolent church inquisition. Oh, and the, 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 the church and the inquisition have a lot to answer for. But <laughs> this idea of this dark omnipresent evil church hunting down anyone that stands in their way that's of course a central problem of of my middle ages book uh mm -hmm. where especially that that middle chapter the medieval church actively suppressed knowledge and science mm -hmm. and i think that's uh, at play in that video game and um and other games and yeah, and I mean that like that's the point when you talk about witches. It's it's not that you're denying there's problems in the past, and it's not that there weren't lots of problems with the church and other things in the Middle yeah. Ages, but that pushing of what are early modern problems mm -hmm. 
onto the Middle Ages is a way of saying, oh, post enlightenment or not enlightenment, but Renaissance, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. post humanism, let's say we never had those problems. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. they aren't, they're medieval. Like yeah. as yeah. soon as rationality hit, as soon as the Renaissance rediscovered the ancient world and we moved past Aristotle or moved into Aristotle, people are really torn <laughs> about what they think about Aristotle. But anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> suddenly we didn't have those superstitions and we were reasonable and rational. Whereas in fact, those particular, like the church as inquisitor and the problems of the church of the of burning you know, these, these, these outbreaks of what we might call mass hysteria right, and superstition yeah. and whatever are very much a product of the, of the early modern period Yes, <laughs> and of the forces of the early modern period and, and of, and of these forces of rationality and all of these things. So it's not that we need to deny that there was bad stuff about the ancient or about the medieval world It's that we need to say, look, it's not some other thing. Yeah. No. It's part of this myth of that we hit a point in progress and ever since then everything's been forward looking mm -hmm. and we position ourselves within that narrative or people want to position ourselves within yeah. that narrative. And therefore they make this hard break with the Middle Ages and push everything that's superstitious or whatever into the Middle Ages. And it's you get, you know, all these public intellectuals or politicians mm -hmm. or whatever using the word medieval to mean, you know, backwards, backwards and superstitious and, 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 cruel. and cruel and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Because once we once rationality was became a thing, because <laughs> apparently it wasn't before, um, <laughs> we stopped being cruel. Yeah. Yeah. And and that and like torture, right? Torture as a standard mm -hmm. approach to law, you know, getting confessions or things like that. Oh, yeah. that must be medieval. Oh, yeah, that was another chapter that didn't make the cut. Uh, but yeah, uh, I just couldn't. And that, like, I think that's the core problem is, yeah. is not that these, not that there wasn't horrible stuff going on in the Middle Ages. Like, and I think your book does a good job of saying, look, I'm not saying everything was rosy. Yeah. That's not yeah. my point. But, yeah, there um, was some torture, but we yeah. do a heck of a lot more in the, yeah. in and, the modern and the, period. And we justify it with our rationality. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We use our our rationality for all sorts of bad stuff. Yeah, no, I think that's really and and, and video games really are a uh, central place, as you say, right now for shaping public consciousness of a lot of stuff. Even if you don't play them, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, they still affect that the visuals are there, and and there's enough people who are playing them or who are nearby when others play them that they really do affect the way people think. So you mentioned a little bit about your upcoming projects. Sure. I, it's, it has seemed to me from the comments you have made on Twitter that you have quite a few upcoming projects. Would you like <laughs> to tell us about any of them, any others, about what, what you're working on or things that are coming out? Yeah, uh, glad to. As I said, I've got this Black Death book I'm working on. Uh, hopefully that'll be done by the end of next year. I'm just having a field day <laughs> gathering, trying to define the myths. Uh, and there are so many uh, surrounding the mm -hmm. Black Death. But one little project that came out of just the medicine chapter that I really wanted to work more on um, in the, the chapter, medieval medicine was nothing but superstition. Mm -hmm. I was really taken by and finally sat down and read all the way through a novel from the 80s called The Physician by Noah Gordon. Okay. And it was made into a movie just a couple of years ago. And both are very problematic, but not no, no big surprise here. The movie is much more problematic than the book. <laughs> anyway, it's got the... It, perpetuates this idea of medieval Europe completely backwards, medieval Islamic world, though, nearly enlightened. <laughs> and uh, it plays off that uh, duality way too much. And mm -hmm. one of the heroes of the book is the real Islamic physician Avicenna, or Ibn Sina. Oh, right. And mm -hmm. I just mentioned that character in passing. Sure enough, in the movie, he's played by Ben Kingsley, sort of the, mm -hmm. the all-purpose... <laughs> Uh, uh, Not benevolent. quite white person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and a whole other issue there. But now they sat down and re read the book all the way through, watched the movie, thought more deeply about this. I'm, I'm, I'm writing a chapter for a book that's will be coming out, I hope, in a couple of years. It's just starting, edited by a different person, Lucy Barnhouse, mm -hmm. on medieval medicine in pop culture. Right. And it's tentatively being called Beyond Cadfile. Uh, so we've got the uh, character of Catfile, but my <laughs> chapter contribution will be about Avicenna in pop culture, and especially in modern Middle Eastern pop culture, where he has become mm -hmm. one of their greatest heroes. Mm -hmm. They put him on stamps. Uh, several nations claim to have his body, <laughs> and he <laughs> becomes this all-purpose intellectual and religious hero. 
but the West has claimed him too. <laughs> and right. he, for, uh, I'll say the West here, it means America and England and France, really, um, he's become the good medieval Muslim who is not trapped by his religion, but follows reason. And he's different mm-hmm. things for different cultures. And so he's a great character. And another project I have, God, I'm doing a lot right now. I've actually got a book coming out uh, in just a few weeks from Broadview Press. This is a reader of primary sources called Medicine and Healing in the Pre-Modern World. And, oh, that's um, really good. Okay, really useful. And, and that's, explic- yeah. that's explicitly a classroom book. I mean, it's about 100 mm-hmm. sources from all the way from ancient Egypt up to late Black Death. So covering about 4,000 <laughs> years of not just Western. I try to extend it well into Africa and uh, Middle East and beyond, but pretty much that sort of Western post-Plato, post-Aristotle world, and it really especially Hippocrates. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's coming out in a few weeks. And So it's a history uh, of the humor is basically is what you're saying. Exactly. It's a lot of humoral <laughs> theory, but because... But not only. Yeah. yeah, not only. I, because I call it medicine and healing. It's not just humors and hippocrates and galen there's also religious healing uh Mm. magical healing different ways that pre-modern people thought they could improve the health hasten death in a nice way (laughs) so Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work trying to narrow that down to just uh 91 sources written in visual into afford an affordable book but so i'm really excited about that and a similar uh, project coming out, I hope next summer that I'm doing for Toronto is a history and sources of medieval pharmacy and drugs. And so mm. that's going to have a long, long essay sort of synthesizing. And this really is my area of expertise, uh, synthesizing how do you study medieval drugs? What was medieval pharmacy? Mm. How is it similar and different from modern pharmacy? And again, it's, that's a classroom text. It provides students uh, with uh, selections from medieval texts. Uh, I'll be translating all of those myself, uh, providing new translations, and a selection of uh, modern articles from other scholars of the history of pharmacy. So it gives students a handy, we're calling it a case study, a handbook mm-hmm. for how do I go about studying medieval drugs and pharmaceuticals. So hmm. a lot on my plate, <laughs> the, all these projects <laughs> overlap. Uh, right. Some are obviously more pop audience or high school student level. Others are meant for we'd say, grad students and scholars for getting a deeper look at some of these subjects that I'm interested hmm. in. Fascinating. That's a, yeah, that's a ton of that's stuff you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it's making me, it's making me stressed just listening to you. <laughs> I, 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 lo- I love writing. I, lo- I love research. Yeah. And so. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the the source book for medicine, for instance, could be, you know, that's the sort of thing where I'm like, I might draw on parts of that for my sex and the body in the ancient world class, for instance, or something like that. Like that sounds like it can be quite useful, even if you didn't use it for uh, an actual course on medicine. Yeah. And I've included significant classes. sections in that uh, uh, on gender gynecology, Mm -hmm. uh, childbirth, obstetrics, uh, abortion, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. issues that you wouldn't find in uh, similar books in the past. (laughs) This is a a medicine reader for the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Mm, Very good. Well, I think on that note, we should probably (laughs) uh, let you go and get writing because now I'm just going to feel that anytime I see you on Twitter, I just want to say, no, you have things to write. Go away. (laughs) (laughs) Not that you're an inveterate Twitter or anything, nothing like me. (laughs) <laughs> so everyone do check out the book again it's the middle ages facts and fictions by winston black it is well worth your time it is both very entertaining but also you will learn a whole lot from it and it is not scolding i i just realized i wanted to say this earlier <laughs> it's not scolding or dismissive of people who have these myths no, and i think that's really crucial mm-hmm. it does not say you're dumb because Thank you think God. this <laughs> it says hey there's lots of good reasons why you would think this about the ancient world because lots of people have tried to tell you it and uh, i think that's an absolutely important part of the tone i just forgot i wanted to say that earlier <laughs> Good. I was aiming for that. Thank you for saying that. And, yeah. you know, I probably should have said uh, at, at the beginning, uh, but, you know, full disclosure, uh, Winston and I are old uh, grad school <laughs> companions. So uh, we yes. both were at the Center for Medieval <laughs> Studies at the University of Toronto. So it was lovely to chat with you again. It was great talking with you guys. I was a little afraid because weren't you my TA? Ooh, <laughs> I don't even remember now. 
<laughs> that was, was a long, long time ago. ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the the old hierarchy suddenly uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. establishing themselves. He's going to correct my conjugation. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't get the Latin wrong. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you've probably been working much more with Latin sources than Mark has in the last in the few years. years. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was really nice to catch up. and uh, Yeah, it was great talking with you. And um, good luck with the next book coming out and with all, all the, the other, other things, things you're you writing so and uh, yes. sharing those as well. And so happy new school okay. year, everyone. <laughs> oh, and, and one last thing. Uh, if anyone wants to you know, find you on the oh, internet, yes. how can, and if they're interested in, in your work, how can yes, they Yes, uh, the, the, the best place is probably through Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Winston E. Black. Uh, also to go by the, the nickname Medieval Medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of private stuff there, <laughs> personal stuff rather, but also a lot on Medieval Medicine and Black Death and anything else I find interesting. So that's a great place to catch up on what I'm doing lately. Great. Well, thanks again. Okay. And uh, we'll hopefully talk online soon. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.